Hello, this is World History, Unit 8 Test Review. We call this 889, and it's an extra credit test review. And we've got some definitions and some questions. And I'm just going to go through each one of these and comment on them and try to give you some insights as far as reviewing for this upcoming Unit 8 test. And so we're just going to go right down the list. We won't waste any time. And as you listen to this, Simply pick out the stuff that you think is the most important, the key words, the key ideas. It's really for you to study. And so don't worry about complete sentences or anything like that. We're just looking at just the key ideas. And so let's begin with this concept of absolute monarchy. What is it? That is a government in which the king has complete and centralized authority. There's no constitution to tell that monarch what he can or cannot do, or what she can or cannot do. There are also, have also been queens that are, have been in this position. He or she makes the laws, and every law is, e is legal because that's what he or she wishes. And that's opposed to a limited or constitutional monarchy. That's the next thing. And those are two names for the same concept. And that's a government in which, yes, there is a king, there is a monarch, but that monarch's power is limited by a constitution and a representative body, such as, for example, Parliament in England or the National Assembly in France. And you've got a third type of government right here. You've got absolute monarchy limited or constitutional monarchy, and then you have what's called a republic. And that's a government in which there simply is no monarch. They have a constitution which doesn't mention a monarch. There's no job for a monarch to do in a republic. The United States is an example. We have a wonderful U.S. constitution. No monarch is mentioned anywhere in that constitution. So you've got two types of democracies that we talked about. We've got a direct democracy, and then we also have a democratic republic or republican democracy. So a, di a direct democracy is this. That's a government in which the citizens vote directly on every piece of legislation, every decision, every issue. And um, that's not very practical, particularly in a country of, let's say, the United States with 330 million people in it. And so what we have instead of a direct democracy is we have a democratic republic or republican democracy. And that is a republic in which the citizens elect representatives to vote on their behalf, to vote in their interests. And if you don't like the way your representative operates, if you don't like the decisions that your representative makes, you get to vote, him, vote that person out in the next election. Divine right of kings, what is that? That's a doctrine, kind of a, a, a government theory, which says that the king is placed on the throne by God and is answerable to no one else but God. And it's the legal argument that these absolute monarchs used to maintain their absolute power and centralized authority. And that takes us to the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta w was the first attempt really to, to chip away at some of this divine right of king's power. And the Magna Carta was a document that King John of England was forced to sign in the year 1215. And this document protected certain individual rights of his nobles, the people just under him. And that was later extended to protecting the rights even of peasants as well. Speaking of the Magna Carta, let's talk about what Parliament is. That's an English term, and it is the representative body that was established in England in the year 1295 as a result of the political momentum created by the Magna Carta 70, 70 years earlier, back in 1215. These things don't tend to happen overnight, especially when they've never happened before. And so this process of, of depowering the king takes years and generations. Let's talk about what the Act of Supremacy is. 
And this kind of goes back also to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the act of supremacy was an act of both Henry VIII and his parliament both working together in the year 1534, which made Henry VIII the head of the church in England. You had a new church in England. It broke away from the Catholic Church. Up to then, it had been part of the Catholic Church. And now you had a new church in England. It was called the Church of England, or you could also call it the Anglican Church. And so that was the Act of Supremacy. The Act of Uniformity, however, was passed by his daughter, Elizabeth I. That was an act of Elizabeth I and Parliament in the year 1549. And the Act of Uniformity resolved the religious issue at the time. It made Anglicanism, or the Anglican Church, that's the Protestant Church of England, that was formed after the Protestant Reformation by her dad, Henry VIII, which we just talked about. That made it the official church in England, but it also was an act that, um, in which the Anglican Church's more Catholic rituals and traditions were retained. Now, we won't go into why there was so much hatred and so much mistrust in England between Protestants and Catholics during this period, but there was a lot. And the Act of Uniformity staved off the conflict between Catholics and Protestants in England for a while because the official Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, uh, had things about it that both these moderate Protestants and moderate Catholics could be happy with. It wasn't part of the Catholic Church. It was its own church, yet it had a lot of Catholic-like elements that made the Catholics happy. This takes us to the English Civil War. This was a civil war in England from 1642 to 1651, and it was between Parliament and King Charles I. Now you've really got King Charles pushing his divine right of kings political theory and Parliament pushing back against that to the point where each side has armies and are fighting each other with weapons and death and carnage and destruction. And um, it was a struggle for power between the monarch and the parliament over many issues, especially, once again, religion. Charles I, as we saw, lost that war and was beheaded, and Oliver Cromwell came to rule England as a military dictator for almost five years from 1653 to 1658. These years aren't really that important. I'm just giving them to you so that you can have something of a time frame. In the year 1660, England restored its monarchy after having killed its king. No monarch. But they restored their monarchy by asking Charles I's son, Charles II, to come to England and rule as king. And so Charles II ruled from 1660 to 1685. And when he died, he was succeeded by his brother, James II. So that brings us to the Glorious Revolution. So the Glorious Revolution was the overthrow of James II, Charles II's brother, in the year 1688. And the reason that it was called the Glorious Revolution was because it had very few casualties, especially compared with the English Civil War, which killed thousands and thousands. England had two big problems with all four of these Stuart kings, James I, Charles I, Charles II, James II, for 85 years, counting the, uh, the interregnum, from 1604. Three, when Charles I ascended to the throne, all the way to 1688, when James II was deposed and taken off the, off the throne, these problems were political and religious. Politically, all four of these kings believed in absolute monarchy and the divine right of kings, which caused tremendous and even deadly, as we've seen, strife between themselves and parliament, their nobles. 
and religiously, all four of these kings um, fell anywhere from having Catholic sympathies to, like, James I, to being just openly Catholic, like James II. And um, the only thing keeping James II on the throne at that time was the fact that he had an adult daughter named Mary who was Anglican, that is to say Protestant. And so Parliament was willing to wait for James II to, to go ahead and die so that his daughter could ascend the throne and um, because they wanted a Protestant monarch. But then, in the year 1688... Nightmare scenario, James I had a son, a male heir, which was going to knock Mary out of that first, out of being first in line for the throne. And now, Parliament was basically looking at a continuation of a Catholic Stuart dynasty on the throne that could go on indefinitely. And that was the last straw for Parliament, and that broke the camel's back. And Parliament invited James II's Protestant daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, to come to England and rule as king and queen. And they deposed James II, England's last Stuart king and last Catholic king. And that brings us to this English Bill of Rights. This document, the English Bill of Rights, was the result of the Glorious Revolution. William and Mary, the new king and king, king and queen, agreed to sign this English Bill of Rights in the year 1689, the very next year. And the English Bill of Rights protected individual rights of English people, unless you were Catholic. And it also established the power of the English Parliament as being greater than the power of the English monarch. So, the Enlightenment. Haven't we talked a lot about the Enlightenment? That was a major part of Unit uh, Unit 7, actually, and it plays a big role in Unit 8. The Enlightenment was a large intellectual movement in which thinkers questioned all kinds of traditional values and beliefs. It piggybacked off of the scientific revolution, but it took some of the some of the elements of the scientific revolution, and instead of applying it to the natural universe like the scientific revolution did, it instead applied those kinds of principles to society. How can we use, identify, and use laws that govern society, institutions, and even education, and even the human mind, and how can we use those laws to actually push society forward? The Enlightenment was very forward-thinking. So that, that question of the Enlightenment brings us to this idea of what is a philosoph. Philosoph is a person. A philosoph is an Enlightenment thinker, one of those Enlightenment thinkers uh, that we've talked about, Denis Diderot and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Montesquieu and Voltaire. These were all called philosophes. So a, a philosoph was an Enlightenment thinker and contributor to the body of Enlightenment ideas that were circulating and being talked about and pushing society forward to places where it had never been before. So that's what a philosoph is. Speaking of philosophs, we can talk about what a social contract is. The idea of a social contract actually evolved over time during the Enlightenment period. A social contract started out as the idea of an agreement. It doesn't have to be written anywhere. You don't have to necessarily be able to see it or touch it. But it's an agreement between a ruler and and his subjects, in which both sides, ruler and subject, have duties and obligations to each other. And Thomas Hobbes talked about that, and um, uh, John Locke talked about that. But then Jean-Jacques Rousseau expanded this idea to be an agreement not necessarily between ruler and subjects, but to be an agreement among a, a group of moral and virtuous citizens to put the common good above their own 
personal selfish agendas. And so that's a, a, a social contract and a huge part of the social contract, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau described it, is this idea of the general will. The general will says this, that the policies and the values that come out of this virtuous citizenship, uh, successfully living under that social contract that I just talked about, which the government should now reflect, is the general will. If the citizens are sufficiently buying into this social contract idea, the general will will come out of the, the virtuousness and the morality of the people living with each other under this social contract. And the general will should be reflected by the people's government. And the general will will always be right. So that brings us to natural rights, since we're talking about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a big part of Unit 7 and 8. We saw the, in Unit 7, we saw the Enlightenment emerge, and then in Unit 8, we saw its impact on countries like the United States and France. And so remember that natural rights are uh, an Enlightenment idea that it was really getting from the idea of natural laws from the scientific revolution. And natural rights are rights that people have just because they're people, just because they're human. Rights such as life, liberty, and property. You don't have to earn these rights. You don't have to buy these rights. They're yours because you're human. Popular sovereignty Popular sovereignty refers to rule by the governed, rule by the people. Remember that uh, popolo means people. And um, uh, it's ruled by the people rather than being ruled by the divine right of some king. John Locke came up with the idea of popular sovereignty, and his message to monarchs and kings was, you may think God put you on that throne. It may feel like God put you on that throne. But it's actually the people who let you be on that throne and they can take you off of that throne anytime they want to. So you better be about protecting their rights so that they have a reason to keep you around. Taxation without representation. Tax, that's basically t taxing people without considering their views, without providing an avenue or a mechanism for, for giving them a voice in the decisions uh, that revolve around taxing them. And that was a big, huge rallying cry, as we know, for the American Revolution. The Declaration of Independence, that was a document written by Thomas Jefferson, highly influenced by John Locke, which justified the American colonies breaking away from England. You've got the Declaration of Independence, and you've also got the United States Constitution. And this was a document which outlined the structure of our democratic republic. It was highly based on the ideas of Montesquieu. And later on, it had a Bill of Rights, 10 amendments added to it, um, which outlined individual rights and which was highly influenced by numerous uh, Enlightenment thinkers. Three branches of government. That's a Montesquieu's idea. That's a Montesquieu idea. Montesquieu's executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Within all of these three branches, Montesquieu uh, uh, talked about the separation of powers and a system of checks and balances. Um, and these ideas came out of Mon Montesquieu's scientific study of the British government and the British Constitution, where he spent a year and a half, and he published this study in a book called The Spirit of the Laws in 1748. Separation of powers, let's just define that real quick. Se separation of powers is Montesquieu's description that each branch of the government, each of these three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial, um, have different powers and different responsibilities. And then checks and balances, this was um, Montesquieu's idea, and it was a description 
of each branch of the government, these three branches, uh, as having the, the means and the power to keep the other two branches from gaining too much power. And then you've got the Bill of Rights. This was a, a, a 10 sets of individual rights that were amended to or added to the U.S. Constitution in the year 1791. And like I said, it was highly influenced by numerous Enlightenment thinkers and influenced by the English Bill of Rights, which we just talked about. So an estate, what is an estate? An estate is basically a French social class of people that existed during this time, and there were three. You had the first estate, second estate, and the third estate. And the most important one for us is the third estate. That first estate consisted of the clergy. It was the church and all the people that worked for the church. The second estate was the nobility, the aristocrats, those landowning people who uh, uh, who had they had castles and they had uh, noble titles, and the king was also a member of the second estate. But the third estate, that's the one with by far the most people in it. At least ninety five percent of the population belong to that third estate. So the third estate basically consists of the common people in France who are not clergy and who are not nobility and who pay all the taxes because the church and the nobility, they pay zero. Um, they're the vast majority of the people and they are seriously underrepresented, underrepresented in the government. Many were peasants, but a growing number of, of, uh, of members of the third estate were also quite educated and urban and professional and even, dare I say it, rich. Lots of money, lots of wealth, no noble title though, no privileges, still got to pay taxes and they want more of a voice in the government. And we call these people those who are urban, educated, professional, wealthy. We call those the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is a rising middle class of third estate, common people who are, like I said, wealthy, educated, professional, and urban, and who are demanding recognition and representation in the French government. And all of this, that leads us to the Estates General. You can put a dash right there, too. You might, uh, Estates General, let's put a dash right like, right like that. Estates General. So what is the Estates General? Well, keep in mind, England has a par parliament. France has an Estates General. This was the representative body in France. Before the year 1789, it had not been called into session for 175 years. The uh, representative bodies like the Estates General tend to compete with monarchs for power and authority. But Louis XVI had, he was forced to call the Estates General into session because the financial crisis that was threatening France was so great that he had no choice. So in the Estates General, all three estates had delegates, representatives. However, the way that the voting worked in the Estates General is that each of the three estates gets one vote on any issue, any piece of legislation. So the first and second estates, even though they were a tiny, uh, uh, represented a tiny amount of the population, they tended to vote together to preserve their privileges, such as no taxes. So if anything, uh, that if, there, if there's anything that the third estate wants that the first and second estate don't want, third estate's not going to get it because they're going to get outvoted two to one because each estate gets one vote. Not each representative, but each estate gets one vote. That brings us to the National Assembly. 
the National Assembly formed out of a protest about this voting procedure. Over half the delegates to the Estates General were from the Third Estate. The Third Estate were hoping that the voting rules would be one man, one vote when this Estates General was called for the first time in 175 years. Then they would have a numerical superiority because there were more of their representatives in the Estates General. But the first and second estates decided that the voting rules would be one estate, one vote. And with that, the members of the third estate left, formed their very own assembly. They called it the National Assembly, and it was going to take responsibility for solving uh, France's uh, financial crises, including the taxation issue. This takes us to the Bastille. What was the Bastille? The Bastille was the royal prison in Paris. It was where political prisoners were kept. The people of the city of Paris stormed the Bastille looking for weapons and ammunition when they were afraid that Louis XVI was going to attack Paris with an 18,000-man army that he had amassed outside the city in response to the National Assembly that we just talked about because the king didn't like this idea of the third estate breaking away from the estates general and forming their own assembly. And uh, the crowd in Paris, they didn't find any weapons, um, and they didn't find many political prisoners inside the, the Bastille either, or many prisoners at all, actually. But that didn't matter. The significance of the Bastille was that the common people uh, had stood up and defied royal power and had gotten away with it, and it sparked similar insurrections all over France. And the people of France celebrate Bastille Day on July 14th every year as their Independence Day. The story of the Bastille informed informs the French people even today about what kind of people they are. There are people who will confront government power when it dismisses their power and ignores and exploits them. So it has a, a tremendous amount of meaning, meaning for French people even today. That brings us to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Very, very important document, really, for the world. This, this document uh, was produced by this newly created French National Assembly. It was highly influenced, once again, by Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke. And it spelled out the individual rights of French men. So it was a product of the French Revolution. So what was this French Revolution? Well, we've already been talking about it, even if you didn't know it, because the French Revolution really began with the Estates General and the Third Estate breaking away, forming their own assembly that they were going to call the National Assembly. The, the French Revolution was basically a transformation of the French government from being an absolute monarchy under Louis XVI all the way to being a constitutional monarchy, still with Louis XVI as king. And so that's the French Revolution. But the French Revolution quickly evolved into a French republic. So it became more radical than just the French Revolution as we know it. Because um, the French Republic was the government of France that existed from 1792 to 1804. And it was after they executed Louis the Sixteenth. The government lasted twelve years, up to 1804, and it survived the the National Convention. It survived the Committee of Public Safety. It survived Maximilien Robespierre and his reign of terror. Um, it survived numerous large scale wars. It survived um, uh, the uh, the Thermidorian reaction, which was a big pushback against Robespierre and Robespierre's followers. It survived a five-man executive called the Directory. It survived Napoleon's rise to power. And it finally ended when Napoleon declared himself to be the first emperor of France in 1804. The Legislative Assembly, what is that? 
The Legislative Assembly was a representative body that replaced the, the National Assembly and lasted really less than a year, from 1792 to, 1791 to 1792. Maximilian Robespierre's motion in establishing the election procedures for it was that no one from the National Assembly could run for office in the new Legislative Assembly. And this... Um, uh, was called the self-denying ordinance, and it resulted in a lot of members of this new legislative assembly being young middle-class delegates who had no political experience, and it was a, really a complete disaster as a governing body. And what ultimately killed the legislative assembly was that uh, King Louis the Sixteenth was caught trying to leave the country. And eventually, a mob attempted to kill the king. And at that point, the Legislative Assembly had no choice but to strip the king of his titles. And the constitutional monarchy that had been created by the previous National Assembly was no more. The Committee of Public Safety, you hear about the Committee of Public Safety a lot. What was it? Well, now that France no longer had a king... A national convention had to be put together um, in order to form a republic. If you don't have a king, you don't have a monarchy, what you've got is a republic. So uh, the national convention uh, was called to do this. So you've got these bodies that are actually quite different from each other that, that emerge over time and kind of passed from one to the next. You started out with the Estates General, then you had the National Assembly, then you had the Legislative Assembly, then, you know, uh, then you've got this National Convention. And so the National Convention became the French government. Robespierre led a radical faction of the National Convention, which eventually took the entire National Convention over and made Robespierre basically... Uh, the leader of France, or at least one of the most prominent leaders of France. The National Convention formed the Committee of Public Safety to deal with internal and external threats, which were very real, both of them. And this Committee of Public Safety also did such radical things as trying to de-Christianize the entire country of France and replacing the traditional calendar with a new calendar that had different months and even different ways that a week is constructed. You no longer had seven-day weeks. You had 10-day weeks that were called decades. And so the Committee of Public Safety, if you're going to talk about the Committee of Public Safety, you got to talk about the reign of terror. This Committee of Public Safety, led in large measure by Robespierre, literally guillotined thousands of suspected traitors, over 16,000 of them. And this lasted about a year from, about, from 1793 to 1794. What is this Thermidorian reaction? The Thermidorian reaction marked the end of the reign of terror. It took place on the ninth day in the month of Thermidor. And you might say, well, the month of Thermidor, what in the world is that? Now, I know the 12 months of the year, and none of those 12 months is called Thermidor. Well, keep in mind, there was a new calendar. They had changed the, the names of all the months. They even changed how long a week was. And so you might say, there is no month of Thermidor. Well, there was in France, because Robespierre had replaced the calendar with a new one that had been made up and really constructed in a more scientific manner, to be honest. And this was, uh, so this was the day that the National Convention, that ninth day of Thermidor, this was the day that the National Convention finally realized that Maximilian Robespierre was so dangerous and so unpredictable that no one in the National Convention was safe, so they arrested him and guillotined him the next day. So, um, uh, there are three more things that we need to define. Let me see if I can just define these real fast. All right. Uh, we've got the Congress of Vienna. Uh, 
All right. The Congress of Vienna was a nine-month series of meetings from the year 1814 to, to the year 1815, and that sought to restore power after Napoleon's defeat, who we may talk about. It was headed by the French foreign minister, and his name was Clemens von Metternich. And uh, so it was basically an attempt to restore some of which had been lost to the Enlightenment, as from their perspective, lost to the French Revolution, lost to the French Republic, and maybe most importantly, lost to Napoleon and his conquests. So that's the Congress of Vienna. Another one that we've got is this. We've got the balance of power. Of power. That is a concept that goes back to the Renaissance. The balance of power refers to a highly desirable political situation in which countries have alliances that assure that no one country or no one alliance of countries is power, powerful enough to dominate the rest. You can kind of think of it as very something similar to the system of checks and balances that Montesquieu described in government where you know, you've know got three branches and each of these branches has uh, checks and balances that it can use to keep the other two branches from dominating the entire government. So balance of power is also huge. The German Confederation or the, uh, yeah, Confederation. What is the German Confederation? This came out of the Congress of Vienna. And it was a new configuration of German-speaking states in Europe or German-speaking kingdoms in Europe, you might say. It was established by the Congress of Vienna in the year 1815. And it was a replacement for uh, that old Holy Roman Empire that we've talked about uh, lots of times, which consisted, uh, which Napoleon had destroyed. The, this new German confederation consisted of 39 German states, rather than the previous like 300 plus states, um, and which was a major step towards uh, eventually Germany becoming a unified country in 1871. I mean, think about that. That's a huge leap. You know, getting rid of, you know, going down from 300 plus little kingdoms to just 39, that's a lot of progress towards getting down to just one, one Germany. So, some key people that we need to know. For example, King John of England. Now we're kind of getting into a review of our review. When we look at these people, we're starting to kind of repeat ourselves because these are people who are involved in some of the concepts that we've just been talking about. For example, the King John of England, he was that English monarch who was forced by his nobles to sign the Magna Carta back in 1215. So now you're kind of getting a little bit of a double dose, a double dip of some of these concepts that we're talking about. Queen Elizabeth I. Queen Elizabeth I worked with Parliament to pass that uniformity Act that we talked about, which established a kind of a compromise between Catholics and Protestants in England through the, the uh, Anglican Church or the Church of England that we just talked about. William and Mary. Uh, William was a Dutch nobleman and Mary was the daughter of James II and they were invited to be the monarchs of England after James II was deposed in the Glorious Revolution, provided that they also agreed to sign that English Bill of Rights, which they did in 1689. John Locke, he was an Enlightenment thinker who um, uh, came up with the idea of natural rights and consent of the governed, which said that the and and came came up with the idea that the job of the govern government was to protect rights, particularly life, liberty, and property. Baron de Montesquieu, he was that enlightenment, enlightenment thinker that we talked about who analyzed the English government and described three branches, separation of power, 
a system of checks and balances and who was highly influential in the construction and the design of the U.S. Constitution, even though he lived before then, he was already dead, and the U.S. government. Voltaire. Voltaire was another Enlightenment thinker who advocated for individual freedoms such as speech, religion, and freedom of the press, and who stressed religious tolerance. And he was also highly influential in the Bill of Rights, which was added to the U.S. Constitution later. Jean-Jacques Rousseau just talked about him when we talked about the general will and the social contract. He was an Enlightenment thinker who also advocated direct democracy. And he said, like I just mentioned, that the government should reflect the general will of a moral and, and virtuous and educated citizenry. Thomas Hobbes, an early Enlightenment thinker who described the social contract, he described it in a way different from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who would describe it later. He advocated absolute monarchy as the best way to keep humans in line because they needed it. He didn't advocate absolute monarchy because of divine right of kings. He had a more reasoned, more, dare I say it, even scientific reason for advocating um, absolute monarchy. Thomas Jefferson, he was an American thinker. As you know, he wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was highly influenced by John Locke. King Louis XVI of France, the last absolute monarch of France, he had agreed to a constitution, but he was uh, beheaded when the French, uh, in the French Revolution when France went from being a constitutional monarchy to being a republic. If you're a republic, you don't have a king, and if you've got somebody who used to be a king, killing him might not be that bad an idea. And so then we've got Maximilian Robespierre. Remember, he was in the Department of Public Safety during the days of the French Republic, and he and and the Committee of Public Safety had thousands executed as enemies of France. Edmund Burke, he uh, is actually a a British politician and political theorist. What's he got to do then with the French Revolution? Well, early in the French Revolution, when it looked like things were going to be great and it was going to be successful, it was Edmund Burke who actually predicted that it was going to end in chaos and tyranny. And the reason that he gave for this was that he said that the French had too little experience with democracy. How much experience did they have? None. They were learning on the job. And he turned out to be very right about that. Look at the reign of terror. Um, another person that we have to define, and we're going to put him right here, is, of course, and we had a whole Google form on him, Napoleon. Napoleon. So who was this Napoleon? Military genius, dictator of France. He created the Grand Empire. He instituted the Napoleonic Code. He retained peasant rights. He freed serfs. There were still serfs around. He freed serfs wherever he conquered. He lost in Russia... He abdicated from the throne twice, not once, but twice. And the second time, he was sent to permanent exile on the island of St. Helena, and I showed you where that was. Another person that we really have to think about is this one, Prince Clements von Metternich. Guy with a funny name. What do we know about Clemens von Metternich? What's important about him? Who was he? He was a diplomat. He was the Austrian foreign minister. He was an arch conservative. Hated the Enlightenment. Hated republics. Hated constitutions. Hated individual rights. Um, he was also a staunch Catholic. 
and a leading figure of this Congress of Vienna that we talked about. He was the architect and the protector of what we call the Concert of Europe. And the Concert of Europe was an arrangement established during the concert during the Congress of Vienna, which kept Europe in relative peace for 30 years between 1815 and 1848. Another person that we really need to talk about is Simone, and I'm not going to put the accent mark, I'm just going to say Simon, Simone Bolivar. In your mind, imagine a an accent mark over the O. Bolivar, the country of Bolivia in South America, named after this guy. He's often called the George Washington of South America, and he led a successful revolt of Venezuela against the Spanish and created several new South American nations, which still exist today. So some questions to consider. What was the purpose of the Magna Carta? Its purpose, keep in mind, was to legally guarantee individual rights to King John's nobles in England, including including not being overtaxed. You got the right not to be overtaxed. Um, so what type of government was established in England after the Glorious Revolution? And that would be a constitutional monarchy. So, William and Mary had to sign off on a constitution which put Parliament in a position that was more powerful than they were. What, um, what was the purpose of the Congress of Vienna? That's another thing we got to uh, just review ourselves on real fast. Let's see here. Let's see if I can do that. The purpose of the Congress of Vienna. Let's see, I'd love to put a number with that if I could. Yes. Remember that the purpose of the Congress of Vienna, we talked about it quite a bit. Um, it was to, to restore Europe after Napoleon uh, was defeated to some semblance of what it had been and to establish a conservative government wherever possible. Get rid of these constitutions. Get rid of these governments that, ha that, that are influenced by the Enlightenment and by the French Revolution. Let's go back. Let's turn the clock back and restore kings and get rid of all these things, concepts like liberal things like rights and stuff like that. So, what kind of changes did the Congress of Vienna make to Europe? Changes at the Congress of Vienna. Made to Europe. All right. Well... Let's just go through a quick laundry list of changes. For one, let's let the Holy Roman Empire, which Napoleon had destroyed, stay destroyed. And instead, the Congress of Vienna created the German Confederation. This was a buffer between France and the rest of Europe. And the Congress of Vienna also reinstated many monarchs back to their thrones, whom Napoleon had previously deposed and taken off their thrones. And... It established a long-term situation of a balance of power, which we already defined, in Europe, which lasted quite a while. What type of government was established after the French Revolution? At first, when they still had a king, a, a constitutional monarchy was established. And then what type of government did the French establish after they got rid of their king? Well, you can't have a monarchy without a monarchy. If you've killed him, then you don't have a monarchy. So, they established a republic, and that's a government that has no monarch. So what were the reasons and the causes of the following revolutions? The Glorious Revolution. And we've talked, but now we're coming at it again for like the third round. Remember that the Stuart kings wanted to defy parliament and rule as absolutists. 
and they wanted to reestablish Catholicism in England. That's what brought about the Glorious Revolution. What about the American Revolution? Well, we've already talked about the Enlightenment uh, and the way it influenced the Declaration of Independence. And, of course, we can't forget their rallying cry of taxation without representation. And what were the main causes of the French Revolution? You had this rising middle class, this bourgeoisie that we talked about, demanding representation in the government, demanding more equality. You also had a financial crisis largely caused by um, the, uh, the American Revolution. And finally, you had these ideas of the Enlightenment that were getting around and influencing the thinking of the French people. So this says, list three political revolutions and their corresponding rights documents in the order that they happened. Well, let's start with the Glorious Revolution. What big document came out of the Glorious Revolution? That was the English Bill of Rights. Second one, how about the American Revolution? What big documents came out of the American Revolution? Of course, the Declaration of Independence, which we've talked about extensively, and the U.S. Constitution with its own Bill of Rights added to it. And then what big document came out of the French Revolution? The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which began the French Constitution. You know, we have, you know, our list of rights come at the end of our Constitution. They put their list of rights right up front, then start talking about the structure of the government. So it's kind of the opposite uh, sequence that we've got. How did the Enlightenment influence the spread of political revolutions? Remember that people in other parts of the world saw successful revolutions in America and in France, and they didn't see why they couldn't do it as well. The Seven Years' War... Now, that goes before all these revolutions, right? That lasted from 1756 to 1763. And what was its impact on these revolutions? Well, the Seven Years' War ended with crippling war debt for Britain and a corresponding need to raise taxes in those colonies. And it was also uh, another impact that the Seven Years' War had on the American Revolution was a desire for revenge among countries that had been beaten by Britain and that Britain now dominated countries like especially France and Spain and the Netherlands. All three of those countries helped us tremendously in the American Revolution. And part of the reason was they wanted payback against Britain. What was the impact of the French Revolution? Colonies in the New World, particularly the country of Haiti, were inspired to revolt against their mother countries and gain independence just like the United States had. So what were some key similarities between the causes of the French Revolution and the causes of the American Revolution? We're almost finished. Similarities? Both revolutions had vital support of the common people. Bourgeoisie in France farmers and regular people and shop owners and all of that in, uh, in the colonies. And both of them were fighting for their political rights. What were the key differences between the French Revolution and the American Revolution? First question talked about similarities. Next question, this one is talking about differences. Keep in mind that the Americans were fighting for independence from a colonial power whereas the French were fighting to change the entire government and not just their government, but their society as well. And then how did the revolutionary movements in England and America influence the French Revolution? Keep in mind that the glorious revolution in England and the American Revolution both showed that the people could rise up and change a government that was not protecting the people's rights. And then finally, last question. According to Enlightenment thinker John Locke, what's the purpose of government? Remember that John Locke said its main job, more than anything else, 
was to protect people's natural and individual rights, particularly life, liberty, and property. And so that is the end of our Unit 8 test review. I hope you find it beneficial, and I hope that you do really well on your test.